Hello class. Today we are going to discuss the oral manifestations of the various bleeding and clotting disorders. I am Dr. Saurabh Shrivastava. Now, to introduce this topic, I would say that the various dental procedures which we perform in our operatory, they have a risk of bleeding and may have serious complications, consequences such as severe hemorrhage and the possibility of death if the patients do have some bleeding disorders. Now, we have to practice safely. For that thing, some case history is required regarding these disorders and identification of the disorders is required. And if such a disorder is present, how do we deal with it? It may require a certain amount of consultation with the patient's physician. A systemic management of the disease may be required before operating upon the patient and the dental treatment has to be modified. The basics of hemostasis. Before we go to the oral manifestations directly, we can talk about something about the basic, basic idea of hemostasis and the disorders associated. So we can say that hemostasis can be achieved with, with the vascular phase of hemostasis, platelet phase, coagulation phase, and the fibrinolytic phase. Now there's a video which says that we can have a blood flowing in the blood vessel, where there is injury in the blood vessel, there are platelets and the various coagulation factors which are involved in the coagulation of the blood just by coordinated, in a coordinated manner, they just uh, in, uh, move on to the site of injury, they aggregate at that site of injury and the fibrin and the strands are formed, which stabilize the clot. Now with this video, we can easily identify that how a clot is formed inside the vessel to stop the vessel uh, blood flow from that area where the vessel has been injured. Now there's a flow chart showing the vascular injury and the time taken for the blood clot formation and the hemostasis, the uh, stabilized blood formation. So as per this cascade or the flow chart, it shows that the initial hemostatic blood, it takes about 100 seconds for the formation of fibrin and the initial hemostatic plug. Then after that, from 100 to 1000 seconds, it takes for the stabilization of the clot. Then I have another video which shows the coagulation factors where they, at the site of injury, the platelets, they have various uh, pseudopodia like processes which uh, help the platelets to get aggregated at the site of injury, which is an irregular area. And the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways and its coagulation factors, they utilize that uh, tissue factors. And the factor seven, which comes combines with the tissue factor and gets activated. And then factor 10, which gets activated. Uh, factor 10, it gets activated. And it's also attached to that. And this complex is formed as the in the extrinsic pathway. Then in the intrinsic pathway, various factors which are involved 12, activated to 12A, 11 to 11A, 9 to 9A, 8 to 8A. These all factors get activated in the intrinsic pathway and again 10 is activated to 10A. So 10 help plays a role in both the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways. So this has got a very pivotal role in the coagulation cascade. On this 10A, it associates with 5A and helps the activation of thrombin, which is in the prothrombin phase. Now, these thrombin molecules, which are generated as a result of activation, they come in multiples. And when they come in multiples, these thrombin molecules at the site of clot formation, they activate certain amount of platelets. And these platelets, they coagulate and the fibrin strands are also activated by this thrombins. So this mesh is formed and causes the stabilization of the clot. As you can see, the arterial clot is quite white and the venous clot seems to be reddish in color. So there's the coagulation pathway showing the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways, the common pathway, including factor 10A and the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, then fibrinogen to fibrin and stabilization of the clot. Now after the clot gets stabilized, further process has to be reduced or it has to be stopped. For this thing, there are certain factors which cause inactivation of the thrombosis. 
or the process of clot formation. There are plasma protease inhibitors, which uh, cause inactivation of the coagulation enzymes. Uh, then these plasma protease inhibitors, like the antithrombin, uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor, alpha-2, macroglobulins, heparin, heparin factor, cofactor 2, that is protein C or protein deficiency, which causes thrombosis. If there is protein C as the inactivation factor, in that case, if there is protein deficiency, this protein is not in adequate amounts to cause the uh, inhibition of the coagulation. So thrombosis occurs in intravascular, uh, at the intravascular level. Then we talk about fibrinolysis. How does it occur? The urinary plasminogen activator or urokinase is there and the tissue plasminogen activator is present which activates the plasminogen which converts to plasmin and this plasmin it converts fibrin to fibrin fragments. So this is an enzyme which breaks down the fibrin to fibrin fragments, hence causing the fibrinolysis. Then we talk about thrombosis. What happens? The coagulation process which occurring in the wrong place at the wrong time is called thrombosis. Means we do not want thrombus to be present intravascularly. So there are two types of thrombi which are present. In the veins, they are red thrombi. In the arteries, there are white thrombi. Now clinical findings which can be seen in certain disorders which are having bleeding and clotting problems. So in mild disease, there may be no signs and symptoms, but in some diseases which are more than this stage or which are in the moderate stage, there may be skin or mucosa which may show fatigue formation, ecchymosis may be seen, spider angiomas, hematomas, and jaundice may be seen. In severe hemophilics, what can be seen is deep dissecting hematomas and hematosis of the major joints. What is a deep dissecting hematoma? Sorry. The deep dissecting hematoma is said to be a hematoma which is formed in the soft tissues, especially the muscles or the various facial planes, and it dissects those planes. That is why it is called as a dissecting type of hematoma. Then if we come across any such patient, what laboratory test should we advise to come to a conclusive diagnosis? Now, the two basic tests to evaluate primary hemostasis are platelet count and bleeding time. These are the two basic tests, platelet count and bleeding time. Then there are certain tests to evaluate the status of other aspects of hemostasis, means the other coagulation pathway factors like the prothrombin time is there or the international normalized ratio, INR is there. Activated partial thromboplastin time, thrombin time, fibrin degradation products, specific coagulation factor assays like the assays of factor 7, 8, 9, and fibrinogen. Coagulation factor inhibition or in the inhibitor screening tests, the test for the blocking antibodies. Now, these uh, can be seen as when we see the platelet count and uh, suspect the bleeding tendencies what has been seen is if the platelet count is more than one lakh per cc or the per cubic centimeter of blood then there is no bleeding tendency or there is asymptomatic normal bleeding tendency which clots by itself in the given amount of time for the normal person if this platelet count is reduced less than one lakh but more than fifty thousand that means fifty thousand to one lakh there may be prolonged bleeding after severe trauma. If the trauma is very severe, there may be prolonged bleeding more than that time. The bleeding time may be increased. If the platelet count is less than 50,000, but it is more than 20,000. If it is less than 50,000, then it will be seen as easy bruising after minor trauma. More than 50,000 was after severe trauma. Less than 50,000 is after minor trauma. Easy bruising will be there and bleeding from the mucous membranes can be there, even after minor trivial injury. When it is less than 20,000, there is spontaneous bleeding from the various submucosal areas or under the skin, the cheeky may be seen, and internal organs may also show certain spontaneous bleeding tendencies. 
So it is very, very important that in case diseases or cases where the platelet count has reduced, first we have to know how much platelets are present. Depending on that, we can assess the severity of the condition also. Then the phase of hemostasis and what test has to be advised for which phase of hemostasis as we have studied the various phases. In the first phase where the initial platelet plug formation was there, the platelet count and the bleeding time as well as the platelet aggregation has to be assessed. The platelet count shows that indicates the number of platelets which have uh, which are present to reduce the propensity of the bleeding. The bleeding time, it also helps to assess the adequacy means the qualitative function of the platelets and its aggregation on the injured vascular surface has to be seen in this. The platelet aggregation, the adequacy of the platelet responsiveness to the physiological stimuli can be seen by the platelet aggregation tests. Then the formation of fibrin, the prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time can be seen as the fibrin formation tests where prothrombin time is screening the extrinsic and the common factors, common pathways, the factors which are associated in these two pathways. Partial thromboplastin time, it is screening the intrinsic and the common pathways. And thrombin time, so prothrombin time, APTT and the thrombin time, the thrombin cleavage of fibrin. It is seen by the thrombin time. Then inhibitors of blood coagulation. The inhibitors of blood coagulation after the coagulation is there there has to be an inhibition factors which are uh, associated with the inhibition of that coagulation process now antithrombin it is the quantity of the plasma antithrombin which is determined by this test and protein c and s which are again quantified because these are natural anticoagulants and these can be quantified separately to see whether the anticoagulation process is normal or not. Then we come to the fibrinolysis or the fibrinolytic phase, the last phase which can be tested by the CLOSP stability test where the fibrinolytic activity is in excess or the clot lysis occurs and hence the bleeding. And in this, the incubation for 24 hours in saline can be done where the fibrinolytic activity is in, is in excess. In incubation for 24 hours in 5 ml, urea can also be done where factor 13 is deficient, then lysis occurs. It is also important in seeing miscarriages or assessing the miscarriages due to this uh, deficiency or problem. Alpha 2 antiplasmin can be uh, determined which where the fibrinolysis inhibitor the reduced quantities can cause excessive bleeding due to the increased fibrinolysis this factor is also important for bleeding now when we see any dental patient with a bleeding disorder what are we going to expect from the patient basically we will go through the medical history of the patient if the patient has history usually if the patient is having any disorder patient is less likely to not tell you. The patient will tell you that the person is suffering from this disorder. If the prescriptions are there, it is very easy to assess and diagnose what disorder is there and accordingly plan for the treatment. But many a times prescriptions that are not being carried by the patients to the dentist. So a brief medical history and the suspected disease can be assessed by the history itself. And if they, their uh, diagnostic tests have been performed, you can just uh, ask them about what all tests have been performed. If they know, they will tell you. Some family history can be assessed in history only. Then any past dental treatment has been done and its complications or what all implications have been there in that dental treatment, any episode which the patient remembers. Then in the current phase or the current uh, situation when the patient is suffering from that disease which is there any use of medication now the patient may be having the disease or the bleeding disorder patient may not be knowing that the person is having the bleeding disorder but certain medications which are used for various other systemic diseases can have an impact on the coagulation pathway of blood 
Now, these medicines can be with the hemostatic effect, such as comarins, heparin, aspirin, NSAIDs, and various cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs. And any active medical conditions from the patient have to be reviewed in history, like hepatitis, cirrhosis, any renal disease, hematologic malignancy, and thrombocytopenia. History of heavy alcohol intake has also to be assessed as there is always a risk of bleeding consequences in patients who are having alcohol intake as a habit and subsequently they are always susceptible for a liver disease and liver is producing various coagulation factors so there will always be a problem in the coagulation process. Then if the patient is having symptoms of an hemorrhagic diathesis, such symptoms can be assessed by asking the patient of frequent epistasis, spontaneous gingival or oral mucosal bleeding, easy bruising, prolonged bleeding from superficial cuts, excessive menstrual flow and hematuria as we have discussed previously today based on the platelet counts, we can assess these symptoms. When the history and the review of the systems, it suggests that there is increased bleeding propensity in the patient, we have to advise certain laboratory studies. We cannot proceed further without the laboratory investigations. Now the first two laboratory investigations which we have discussed primary were the platelet count and the dating time. Okay. Then in the bleeding disorders, various clinical features can be seen. Now, the disorder is of having the platelet the deficiency or the vascular phase problem is there or there is only problem in the coagulation phase. We can see by seeing the features of the bleeding tendencies. If it is from the superficial cuts or the scratches, there is less likely to be coagulation problem, more likely to be vascular or the platelet problem. If there is delayed bleeding, if there is delayed bleeding, it is more likely to be in the coagulation cascade problem. Spontaneous gingival bleeding, it is more common in vascular or the platelet types problems. Pachiki are more common in the vascular or platelet type problems. Achemosis can be seen in both the types where the vascular or the platelet uh, deficiency is there or, and also in the coagulation cascades. But there are small and multiple pachiki or ecchymosis which are present in the vascular or the platelet problems, but the large and solitary pachyche may be seen in the coagulation cascade pathway problems. Epistasis is common in both. Deep dissecting hematomas are more common in the coagulation cascade problems. Hemarthrosis are more common in the coagulation cascade problems. Now lab tests to see hemostasis may be platelet count, bleeding time, as I said, prothrombin time, INR, APTG, thrombin time, fibrin degradation products, with modin assays, von Willebrand's antigen analysis, coagulation factor assays, coagulation factor inhibitor assays, these all can be done. Now, how to manage if a patient has come with a bleeding tendency? Management depends upon our preparedness regarding its management. If we know, we can manage. And if we know means, we have to assess the bleeding tendency. If a person is having the bleeding tendency, we have to reduce the capacity, means that we have to reduce the patient's bleeding tendency by incorporating the deficiencies into account, taking the various tests which we have done, taking those tests in our analysis sheet, and then seeing what patient lacks and fulfill it. So that the procedure which we are going to do, it leads to minimum damage, minimum trauma to the patient as per the circulatory system is concerned. So for platelets, we should know where the various factors, various the products, blood products are available in what form. That also is a part which we should know, it's actually. And platelets which are present in the blood bank, they have, they are available in packs. 50 ml, it erases the count by 6,000. 
So we should have an idea how many tax plate, platelet are required by the patient if the patient is having a low platelet count. So fresh frozen plasma again from the blood bank here, uh, one unit is about 150 to 250 ml and it needs one hour of thawing before being introduced into the patient and contains various factors 2, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 5, and 7 also, heat labile, which are the heat labile factors. So thawing should be very gentle. And it is very useful, the fresh frozen plasma, it is very useful in cases of undiagnosed bleeding disorders with active bleeding. So it will arrest the bleeding to some extent. In severe liver disease, when transfusing more than 10 units of blood, it is also required at that time and in patients of immunoglobulin deficiency. Then cryoprecipitate is also available in the blood bank and its per unit is having 10 to 15 ml of the blood as cryoprecipitate and contains fact factors 8, 13, 1 molybdenum factor and fibrinogen. Indicated in hemophilia A, von Willebrand's disease, fibrinogen deficiency, and when the factor concentrates are unavailable. Then we have factor eight concentrate purified anti-hemophilic factor, which is available in the pharmacy also. So when we know there's only factor eight deficiency, we have to replace it with the factor eight concentrate. It raises the level by 2% and the heat treated contains one valvular factor also. So it, uh, hemophilia A with active bleeding or any pre-surgical process we can give. And in some cases of von Willebrand's disease. Then factor nine concentrate is also available in pharmacy. It uh, raises the factor level by one to 1.5% 1 and contains factors two, seven, nine, and 10 and is indicated in hemophilia B with active disease, active bleeding or a pre-surgical phase. Then desmopressin acetate, also available in pharmacy, it is the synthetic analog of antidiuretic hormone, 0.3 microgram per kg, can be given intravenous or subcutaneous, intranasal can also be given, and is indicated in active bleeding or pre-surgical phase for some patients with von Willebrand disease. Uremic bleeding or liver disease can also be, uh, and there's indications in such type of factors. Then epsilon amino caprioic acid, which is available in pharmacy, it is anti-fibrinolytic and 25% oral solution is available. It is given as an adjunct to support clot formation for any of the bleeding disorders. Tranemic tranexamic acid available in pharmacy. It is also anti-fibrinolytic, 4.8% mouth rinse, and it is also given as an adjunct to support the clot formation for any of the bleeding disorders. Now, with uh, this much, we can end this uh, episode or this session as uh, I would like you to sum up the whole bleeding and clotting tendencies, the various investigations, and uh, we'll put up a quiz on some platform and uh, I would like that uh, you should answer that quiz and then we'll proceed to session two. Now, for then, thank you. Till then.